Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm May, the Senior Program Manager for ASB's Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center, and I will be your moderator today. So today is our last uh, of our uh, Day After Tomorrow series. So before we begin uh, the content proper, I would like to invite us uh, to join us, um, Dr. Tan, who's actually the person who's been leading the, this series uh, for the last uh, couple of uh, weeks. And uh, he has a few announcements to make about future opportunities. So Dr. Tan, uh, maybe you can uh, join us and say hi. Hi, uh, hello. Hello everyone. Thank you for being with us again today. Uh, I'm just gonna take a minute here to say that uh, uh, we just want to share with you that, like May said, after nine comprehensive topics with over 3,400 registrations across 20 countries, uh, ASB's The Day After Tomorrow series is uh, coming to a conclusion. Uh, we did this in response to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, we're, after have running, running uh, nine topics, right, uh, we'll, we'll come to a conclusion after today's conversation. We were taken by the support of our communities, right? the ASB faculty, supporting teams, our guest panelists, right? and we're especially grateful to all of you for your participation. Everybody came together in this time of need, and ASB vowed to continue to do our parts, right? whether in our MBA, part-time MBA, and the executive education offerings. You can see the screen right now. If you would like to, uh, uh, you're interested in exploring future opportunities to collaborate, there's a QR code there that you may scan. And by the way, the recordings of all the sessions, all nine sessions that we have run uh, since back in March uh, in this series would also be, be available. Let me just close by saying that, or let me quote Jack Ma, right, who had said once that today is difficult, tomorrow is even more difficult, but the day after is beautiful. So hopefully we're beginning to see the dawn of that day. And um, good luck to everybody. Back to you, May. Enjoy the show. Thank you, Dr. Tan. And thank you all for being uh, taking time out to be here with us today. Um, first of all, of course, I'm very excited to be introducing our esteemed panelists. Um, our very first panelist is, of course, uh, Pon Dulera Abu Bakar. She's actually the CEO of MAGIC, which is the Malaysian Global Innovation and Creativity Center. And that's a household name to most Malaysians here. Uh, I don't think I need to say more. Um, later on, Ponzulera, she will be talking a little bit more about what MAGIC does and um, how that kind of contributes to uh, the solution for what we're talking about today. Prior to that, she's also the CEO of the Cradle Seed Ventures, uh, which is an early stage funding agency in here in Malaysia. Um, and she's also the council member of the National ICT Association. Um, so she wears lots of hats actually, and she serves in many um, roles in government agencies, and she's very well versed in technology, innovation, public equity, so on and so forth. So she's the best person when it comes to the topic that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, and also together with us, we have Professor Rajesh Nair, um, he's the director of the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center here at the Asia School of Business. Um, he is an entrepreneurship himself uh, with more than 25 years of experience in product designs. He's created like more than 100 products um, and he, he himself holds 13 US patents. Um, and also he has a few startups that he has started in the Boston area. And currently he's working on um, creating more innovation in ecosystems in underserved communities uh, around the region um, through the program that he's developed called the Zero to Maker. Um, before we start the content proper, uh, I'd like to do a few housekeeping. So we do it like we have together with us here today uh, participants for from over 14 countries all zooming in at the same time. Uh, so we are, we are also really excited to be harnessing this diversity um, and we do hope that you can contribute to us in this discussion as well. So I, I would ask for you to uh, participate through the Q&A function in the Zoom uh, 
in a Zoom platform. So you can see like on your screen, there is this Q&A button. Uh, you can contribute uh, by asking questions there or alternatively, you could go there and then upvote certain questions that you might like so that we can prioritize them and discuss them in our conversation going forward. Um, so yeah, I'll uh, try my best to include your questions in our conversations today and try to make it a fruitful one for all of us. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, our topic today. Um, as we all know, we're living in an unprecedented time. Um, a lot of us probably are zooming in from home right now, uh, despite it being a working day. Um, and uh, that's because uh, of the current pandemic that the world is facing right now. There's a lot of uh, displacement in terms of employment that has happened. Uh, in fact, I'll just show you a few facts about what's happening around uh, in terms of the employment situation globally. So uh, it's, been, it's been said that uh, today we're facing one of the most severe uh, unemployment crisis since the Second World War. Um, and that, that's, that's, I think, a little bit uh, scary to think about. Like, wow, the unemployment that we're currently facing is actually, you know, close to what, what the world was seeing during a big war uh, that we were, we were having in the world at, at that time. Um, and I think coupled with like the pandemic, I mean, the pandemic happened at a time where the world is also, I guess, like still learning um, to cope with the uh, fourth industrial revolution. So about like technological transformation, uptake and all of these. So this huge, massive economic disruption uh, does exact, uh, amplify this um, process that actually we're like going through. And then more than that, we also have um, social distancing measures. Um, currently today, like it actually affects 81% of the global workforce that we, we live in. So like I'm sure you and me are probably affected in one way or another, some more than others. Um, so the International Labour Organization, the ILO, they estimate that these social distancing measures actually resulted in a reduction of 6.7% of uh, working hours. And that's actually 195 million full-time workers uh, worth of work that's been displaced due to the social distancing me measures that were um, uh, taking on right now to combat the pandemic. Um, some sectors that are most affected includes retail trade, accommodation, uh, and food services, as well as manufacturing. So, I mean, I have painted a, a quite a dire picture here today. Um, of course, we were also discussing that, you know, this this is temporary. Uh, it might, it will, it will probably rebound uh, quite quickly after the pandemic hopefully sooner than later. Um, but we're also curious today, right? Like, um, what are some of the solutions around combating this huge unemployment crisis that we're facing right now? And maybe what are some of the opportunity, uh, opportunities that we see um, going into the future in terms of jobs, employment, et cetera? So without further ado, I'd like to uh, uh, pass the mic over to Bonzulera. Uh, first of all, like, uh, Zulera, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about magic and why you think it's such an important contributor to these employment and economic outlooks um, in, in Malaysia um, and maybe even extended to the region. Um, and maybe cover a little bit more about uh, how employment, uh, entrepreneurship could be maybe a solution to this uh, unemployment crisis that we're facing right now. Zulera? Thank you, May. Um, hi, everyone. A very good morning to all. Um, hi, Rajesh. Hi, Sun. Um, thank you for having me here today on this webinar. You know, it's a it's a very exciting it's a very exciting panel session. It's a very exciting topic as well. So maybe I'll just start with a quick introduction of uh, Magic. All right. So Magic, we are the Malaysian Global Innovation and Creativity Center. Um, so. Literally, our core or our DNA is really around entrepreneurship built around innovation and creativity. Um, that's really, 
to encapsulate what we do. So we 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 program, uh, sorry, we create programs and we deliver programs that is centered around building entrepreneurship talents, right? So we work with early talents, we work with young talents, and we also work with professionals. Um, we also work with startups or we also work with uh, small businesses that want to leverage on technology and innovation, right? Because uh, so we, we strongly believe that entrepreneurship or an enterprise is basically the engine or the vehicle that's actually needed to take an idea, to take a product or to take a solution to where it's supposed to be, to market, essentially. So without entrepreneurship, you can't see product coming to market. All right. Now, entrepreneurship is a very, very important element. And um, so that's what we focus on. We run accelerator programs. Um, our biggest accelerator, our largest sort of flagship program is called the Global Accelerator Program, which we actually run every year. Um, it's, a, it's a cohort where we actually design program over four months. Uh, we get startups through this program. We actually equip them with whatever is needed for you to grow further. So our target is really increasing revenues um, as well as we want them to come out from the program being investable, right? So we, we emphasize a lot on the commercial value in terms of any program that we actually roll out. Um, see, because if you, no matter how good you are or no matter how good your product is, if no one is willing to fund you or there's no market to it, then it's basically pointless. Uh, that's that's basically oversimplifying the the sort of the ethos of the program. But that's essentially what we do, right? We need to make you uh, market ready. Um, that's that's what Magic's um, uh, philosophy is when it comes to entrepreneurship. And uh, I think uh, so. We work with various organizations. We work with universities. We work with esteemed universities like ASB, right? ASB, MIT. Um, we want we focus on a lot more on collaboration. We think collaboration is the way to go. Um, and we work with all the industry partners. We work with private sectors. We work with corporates as well. So in all of our programs, we actually emphasize the importance of market. We emphasize the importance of corporate collaboration. All right. Um, so yeah, that's, that's essentially what we do. Um, you'll find a lot more uh, details of what we do in our website and we're also very active on our social media page instagram facebook so we have all sorts of accelerator program boot camps digital content that's always pushed out through our social media network uh, but at a, at a national level uh, we're an agency where we actually galvanize all entrepreneurship and all technology efforts right so we work with the government sector we work with the private sector. We work with all the agencies. Right now, Magic, we are placed under the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, um, which actually places us in a very important position when it comes to technology and innovation agenda for the country. So as, as I've mentioned earlier, without an entrepreneurship um, sort of uh, capsule or an entrepreneurship um, uh, sort of um, um, agenda, technology and innovation can't be brought out to market. So technology, innovation and, and entrepreneurship is a very, very important tool. So we call it the SDI, Science, Technology, Innovation. And that's where creativity and innovation comes in. So it's a whole one big, one big, one big puzzle that we're looking to solve. Uh, so that's a bit about magic. Now, coming back to jobs and uh, employment opportunities, especially in this period of COVID, right? Um, I think we've all seen how COVID has sort of hit us in many ways that we've not actually expected. Uh, we always preach the importance of building business resilience. But I think many of us didn't, um, we, we, we didn't, we didn't see what resilience actually meant until this period, right? No matter how we were prepared before this, I think everything went off the roof, right? <laughs> everything, eh? everything that we've learned, everything that we've known is no longer applicable, right? So you need to find new ways of operating. You need to find new business models. Um, so we've tried very hard to sort of assist the businesses that are within our programs. And we've also tried and offered some advice to, to the startup community, right? So, but then again, we also need to admit that we don't know everything ourselves. We're trying to figure it out ourselves as well. Uh, so, which is why collaboration is very important. Exchange of knowledge is very important. Understanding how different industries react thing 
to this pandemic is also very important, right? And everything is time bound right now. What works yesterday may not work tomorrow, right? So in the same in the same approach, we look at employment. A lot of our startups, the first thing that they've done, or small businesses per se, the first thing that they've done is that they've laid off employees, right? In the face of a crisis, the first thing that you want to do is you want to reduce your operating costs. Uh, because you know your your revenues are declining. It's either declining or it's close to zero. I think a lot of you here will will uh, will identify with that. Um, and what do you do? And I think it's completely understandable. The first thing you do is to reduce your operating expenditure, and you do that by reducing your headcount. You want to operate leaner, right? And as a result, you've got many unemployed people. But these are all talented, you know, skilled, and these are people that have worked in in tech startups, right? We've got. CTOs applying for jobs right now. We've got tech talents applying for jobs right now. So I think it's also a situation where we've actually seen seeing an emergence of skilled talents that can be immediately tapped, right? So that's one pool. Uh, how do we get them back into the workforce? They could, it could also be in the form of getting them back um, into entrepreneurship, getting, back, getting them back to start tech businesses, you know. Um, so one way that we're looking at it is how do we match existing IPs that are available in the market, right? So, okay, this becomes a bit technical, but we're trying to work with universities. How can we match the IPs that are sitting with the universities with the talent that is available in the market right now? Because you've got ready entrepreneurial talent that can be immediately matched. I mean, that's that's one thing that we're looking at. But again, it's not, it's not as easy. It requires a lot of... Um, Planning it requires a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, structuring in that in that manner, but employment is definitely top in terms of of our, of our priority, um, and and it's definitely I, I'm curious to hear about what Rajesh and you know um, Than has to say about it, but it's 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 definitely top of our priority as well. Great, thank you, Zulera. Uh, like I, I think you mentioned a lot of very interesting points about like business resilience. Yeah. Um, and I think on the note of the STI, science, technology, and innovation, I think that could be potentially you know something that we can look forward to coming out of COVID. Um, sure. And I think the other point that you mentioned that was really interesting was um, how yes, we have a lot of talent that have maybe been laid off, um, but they are also kind of talented people who maybe have some experience um, in the startup and entrepreneurial environment and how can we actually maximize these people. Sure. But I guess now, like, moving on to uh, Prof Raj, uh, yeah, you know, we, we talk a lot about, you know, entrepreneurship and how they do create, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, jobs and new economic activity for the markets. But, I mean, there's always this question in the back of our mind, right? Like, does entrepreneurship really impact uh, the creation of new jobs like wouldn't there be like bigger multinationals out there that you know are creating more jobs than uh, uh, startups um i don't know could you share some some of your uh, research with us maybe sure. thank you may and good morning to all uh, uh so uh, before i get into that i i know for not many people know me i know they all know on zilera and magic so i would like to uh, start with a view from an entrepreneur's point of view. Uh, so uh, just to, uh, before I get to the future, I'd like to get to the past. You, we all heard of this, this five why analysis of getting to the to root cause. And I want to talk about five hows. Uh, so if you could uh, pull up the presentation, the, the slide there uh, may. Uh, so if in January, if someone had told you there is a, a virus that can affect uh, can kill people, spread so fast. Uh, if I had asked, how would it impact others? You would say, we would need to protect e each of us. We would need to do isolation. And how does it impact uh, 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 people? You, you would say, uh, you know, you're going to have, uh, you'll be working from home, but businesses would be, for, you know, you can't go to restaurants and such. Then you, how does it impact the businesses? You may say, you may, several companies may go out of business. Uh, how does it impact people? The people you may say you may, people may lose jobs. How does it impact the, the rest of the society? You may say people have loss of income. It may lead to hunger, poverty, social unrest. So you could actually think forward with these hows. Uh, and that is how an entrepreneur thinks, to look for 
interesting problems that could come in future and look how we can create solutions. And uh, to address this issue that you're seeing today, uh, you know, we have some 15 to 20 percent unemployment in the U.S., some 40 million people who have uh, in the U.S. who have filed for bankruptcy uh, or not bankruptcy unemployment. Now, uh, I believe the uh, the way to uh, turn things around is to create jobs. Now, entrepreneurs are they're not optimists or pessimists; they're realists and an opportunist. They don't look at what's how things are. They they look at how things could be, and they kind of monetize the difference. You know, and if you and so are you know innovators. If you really look at the the situation of ventilators, it used to cost fifty thousand dollars. Now we have designs that are a few hundred dollars. Now this is actually going to change a, a few things. No hospital is going to go easily go buy a fifty thousand dollar ventilator. And no innovator is going to stop at designing the ventilator. They're going to look at what else can it do uh, in this industry with so much margin. Like Jeff Bezos said, now your margin is my opportunity. But this is the entrepreneur's thinking is what is out there that you can that you can create, and that is a way to create uh, solve problems, create startups, create jobs, and uh, create wealth. And by the way, we are only in, in the act one of the whole COVID play, you know, so there is a whole lot more to go. Uh, next slide, please. So if you look at the, uh, there was an article from Kaufman Foundation. Uh, they studied from 1980 to 2005 and found that almost all jobs were created by companies zero to five years old. Okay, almost all. And in 2007, just before the market crash, two thirds of the jobs of new jobs are created by brand new companies. And so, the, what without startups, there would be no net job, new job creation, or it would be actually be negative. So, interestingly, there is no discussions on uh, when you or uh, on job creation from entrepreneurship when we talk of in policy discussions on job creation. And I think that this, you know, entrepreneurship should be brought into the center and, uh, of this discussion of job creation in, in future. So next slide, please. Uh, I believe startups and entrepreneurs are the engines of job creation. So next. So what kind of entrepreneurs are we working on? I know which are the ones who could actually create these kind of jobs. Uh, Professor Fiona Murray and uh, Bill Allitt had an article on this, uh, on innovation-driven entrepreneurs and innovation-driven enterprises. And there's a very interesting uh, comparison they did with SMEs versus IDEs. SME primarily, next slide, please. They talk about uh, things like uh, restaurants, dry cleaners, nail polish, nail uh, uh, salons and, and such. Who are primarily local, uh, the, their expansion is limited, they're linear, and there is no much of innovation required to create the next company and such. Uh, but IDs are the, the Ubers and Airbnbs and you know technology-driven companies that can create value. They also start the similar way. They both start in a little you know, uh, uh, garage, but the, the trajectory of of their growth would be very, very different. You know, the market for an IDE is global. They're totally critically driven by innovation and their growth is exponential. You know, I remember when I started my last company, we started with two people in a room. Four years later, we were 140 people and it was primarily driven totally by technology and, you know, with markets everywhere in the world. Next slide, please. So the... Uh, how do we create these entrepreneurs from from ordinary people in this world, you know, ordinary population? And uh, that has been my research at MIT and my current research at, at, at Asia School of Business too. Uh, how do we take these people who have now been exposed to the idea of entrepreneurship and take them through this phase of maker, which is like the creativity phase where they learn to learn, they're self-learners, creative people who can, ideate and design and make things uh, to innovators who can find problems and solve them 
uh, with the technology and uh, skills they have created and entrepreneurs who can uh, monetize them and you know and commercialize the products that have, that they have designed but when you put them all together what you have is an ecosystem that makers attract zeros and innovators attract zeros and makers and you actually start to attract more and more people into this ecosystem which becomes self sustaining and growing uh, i know there isn't much time to show much of the work here so if you go to zero to maker.org or asia school of business you will actually see a lot of work so one of the innovation driven entrepreneurship program that uh, i i've done run these kind of experiments in different places uh, in a college when you i ran this program and i found in the first year itself uh, there were about 11 and over four years about 21 startups in this in this little college which had one student startup in the previous uh, 12 years since its inception uh, next slide so what it says is that entrepreneurs can be created uh even they may be born with certain skills but they still need to be trained they still need to be created and nurtured next slide so we have been doing this kind of work at asia school of business in in different places you know in universities uh this is the uh, and and communities like in east timor and such and in schools and uh in uh, with the help from uh, fonzilera and magic we did this program in 10 uh rural government schools where we gave them maker labs and such taught these kids how to train them and i truly believe entrepreneurship training should start when they are 10 not when they are in their 20s because you have all the time the decade to build them up and build their confidence next slide please so ecosystem is what actually transforms uh people and communities we need to create the ecosystem can create entrepreneurs ecosystem consists of mentors so uh, and resources and and such uh, that can transform individuals and communities uh next slide so the three takeaway i'd like to take away one is startups and entrepreneurs are created the other engines of uh, job creation innovators and entrepreneurs can be nurtured and ecosystem is what transform people so idea is how do we create this ecosystem uh that can create jobs create companies create wealth to deal with the uh, post covid challenges so back to you thank you raj um yeah i think i think professor raj he talked a lot about you know um how entrepreneurship is the is actually the 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 source of uh, new jobs and also that i think it's a very opti- like positive message that actually innovators can be nurtured and i think that's that's really important um for us coming out of this um and of course you talked a little bit about ecosystems and how that's important in um transferring these skills um across to more people um and i think right now like i guess the 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 we people kind of just thinking about okay so i mean i don't know if everyone has any, like every anyone here has actually think about oh you know maybe i want to be my own entrepreneur one day um but i think with that comes also a lot of barriers right like oh you know uh, i need to worry about this financials uh uh getting a team and things like that uh and more than that like there is also a question that has come up now um that is talking about you know are there actually some new opportunities or solutions that we see uh coming out of this covid period um for, to fill these like new solutions that could fill these uh employment gaps or business opportunities so i guess the next question is for uh fondulera because you have a lot of experience working like from the funding side to the facilitation side of like startups entrepreneurs um so i guess the question for you is what do you think are some of the largest barriers of entry uh in becoming an entrepreneur uh is it personal is it also like systematic um and have you seen any new business opportunities that have emerged uh because of the pandemic thanks me so again that's a it's a very interesting and and a relevant question so when you go back to barriers to becoming an entrepreneur i think prof rajesh here will agree with me i think from an individual perspective if you want to do something there's actually no barrier right you can actually go out and if you think your idea makes sense but again 
you can't, the idea can't just make sense for you, which is why I said earlier, it needs to be validated through the market, right? You need to, you need to know that your idea works, right? So if, if that works, all right, go ahead and do it. But I guess structurally or in terms of the infrastructure around to actually promote entrepreneurship and to actually allow an entrepreneur to take in his idea or product to market, I think as far as Malaysia is concerned, I would, I would, I mean, it, possibly a biased view here, but I would say I think we're very, very, um, how do you say, very, very uh, attuned towards the need of an entrepreneur. I think as far as an infrastructure is concerned, we've got sufficient support as far as capacity building is concerned. We've got su sufficient support as far as funding is concerned. And I think more importantly is the government. Increasingly now, I think the government is giving a lot of emphasis around the need and importance of entrepreneurship. There's a lot of push, uh, even when it comes to even impact investors or impact um, entrepreneurship, right? So in terms of businesses that are generating social and environmental benefits, those are kind of businesses that we also want to actually bring to market at this point. Um, so, and, and, and particularly technology uh, businesses, right? tech startups. And if you look at it, technology and innovation is a very, very core component to any business if you want it to be impactful, if you want the impact to be scalable, and if you want it to grow. So as, as Prof Rajesh mentioned earlier, you've got innovation driven on enterprises. So if you start your business on that note, your chances of scaling it or, or taking it beyond the Malaysian shores is actually far better in that sense. Um, but when it comes to, like I mentioned earlier, when it comes to the structural support, Malaysia has everything. It's just a matter of knowing which door to knock when it comes to building your business and when it comes to growing your business. Um, we, have, uh, we, we need to probably plug some gaps when it comes to funding in this country. But again, I think it's also up to the entrepreneur to be creative in terms of raising funds or in terms of looking for the right resources to grow your business. You've got equity crowdfunding platform that actually allows you to raise funds from the public, right? And if you are, um, say, if you're a social enterprise or if you are an, um, sort of an impact-driven entity, you can raise funds through donations. So Magic also promotes social entrepreneurship. We actually also run something called the Social Enterprise Accreditation Program, which we actually allow um, entities that are very driven towards social and environmental purposes to, to be part of this community. But we also want them to be leveraged on technology and innovation, right? So for as long as you're generating a meaningful impact to the environment and community, you can be part of this alliance. And the end goal is that you will receive incentives in the form of, you know, if you are donated by a corporate or an individual, your donations are actually tax exempt. That's the first step, right? So that's also facilitating financing into the, into the ecosystem. So no matter what kind of an entrepreneur you are, whether you're a social entrepreneur, whether you're a tech entrepreneur, or even if you're an SME, but if you are, if you are actually generating or you're actually creating impact, there's actually no real barrier in this country, I would say. You know, it's, it's just a matter of you know, uh, reaching out to the right people. Um, and I think on the other part around, um, sorry, I missed your other question, May. So what are the opportunities that you see that has come up? Yes, yes, yeah. correct. So that's what I thought. So the pandemic has actually, as much as it is, you know, a challenging situation, but I think it is also a time where a lot of opportunities, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, with crisis comes opportunities, right? That's, there's always an opportunity for you to look at, look at new business models and new ways of operating. So I think especially in, I'll give you one example. So we had a social enterprise. I think it's a very popular social enterprise. Huh? Um, what they actually did is because, you know, the current operating model didn't work, they pivoted, they used their existing resources to start generating, to start producing PPEs, you know, started, started creating more facial masks, right? So that's, that's one quick win, right? So they immediately pivoted their business model, they turned around. So we had also another tech startup who was in the business of points of sales. I think you know them quite well as well. So they were in the business of point of sale. And um, their, their sort of customers, by and large, were F&B owners. When, when MCO hit, 
FNBs were not able to operate physically, right? So the only way to operate was to actually turn their model online. They needed to do online delivery. So what this business did, what, what this startup did was to reach out to all of their FNB customers to say, okay, how can we help you now? So they actually turned the business model around to turn it into an online delivery app. So even businesses that could not, that did not deliver online prior to MCO started delivering food online. Right. So, look, I think at the end of the day, it's about identifying opportunities and working within your resources and your constraints to turn your business model around. Right. I, 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 that, that's really the spirit that should be in this situation. But again, I would also agree and I would also say that not all businesses are designed to pivot during this period. Right. Some will probably just need to stay home and not do anything. Right. That's a given. I think, Prof, maybe you can you can interrupt and say something about yeah. this as well. You know, yeah. we've got many businesses coming to us and say, oh, you know what? How can we business, pivot our business model? My answer is we'll really need to look at your market. We really need to look at your product. Not all businesses can be turned around and not all businesses can pivot at this point. Right. So I, I have quickly, I have, you know, any business or the entrepreneurs require opportunity, skills, and resources. Okay. Yeah. Opportunities are problems in disguise. Yes. Uh, today, we have 100 times more problems than we had BC. I'm, I'm talking about BC as before Corona. Okay. Uh, the, we, today, we have so many more problems, and people really want to solve these problems. There is money there. Uh, if uh, so, entrepreneurs need this is a golden age for entrepreneurs and innovators. If we ever get to once in a lifetime, hopefully, pandemics don't come more than once in a lifetime. <laughs> so, uh, this is absolutely the opportunity for entrepreneurs to identify these problems and solve them. Skills I see zero difference in skill level from any country. I've taught in small rural schools to top schools in the world. Okay, uh, in uh, and students, I found that they're equally intelligent. What is missing is the kind of ability, that exposure that have, they've been given, and the access to things that have been given, and that actually can be uh, can be done. Uh, and comes to resources, entrepreneurs start with zero resources. They always work with resources they do not have. Sure. Now, when when you talk about uh, for, we we you know during COVID uh, the the reality has changed. Several of these changes that we have seen are chemical changes. They are not going to come back to previous lives, the previous uh, state. Some of them are physical changes that are going to slowly change change back. Uh, but either way, the re ground reality of the market has changed. Any company that is standing still would be like, you know, in a, uh, uh, freezing in headlights would be roadkill. Okay, so we need to look at it carefully to see, uh, analyze to see, are the, three, uh, the things going, going to go back to the previous uh, way of doing business? Or you, is your customer still there? Are the uh, customer reality has it changed? You know, so this requires a, a very interesting analysis uh, at every company, you know. Uh, so, uh, I, I truly believe that opportunities are abundant today, and anyone who uh, who's even having one, you know, interest in any interest in starting on a startup, this is the time to do it. And and I believe there are paying customers to solve real problems. Great, thanks, Professor Raj. Uh, I think yeah, I think you chimed in pretty well on 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 these various opportunities. Um, however, like right now, I, I just scrolled through the uh, Q&A section and I think yeah. there is uh, this person who asked, um, startups often take time to monetize and also even less stable than large MNCs, multinational corporations. So how does creating or joining a startup in this inconsistent and unstable period going to sustain that long-term job opportunities in the market? And I guess this is kind of linked to another question that's being asked like, you know, how, how do we actually create these environments so that we can yeah. actually, you know, support more people to be able to pursue these maybe as a, as a, as a possible opportunity? Nay, on that note, I think even big companies, you don't have job security. Exactly, that's a myth. I agree. <laughs> job <laughs> security myth. is a myth. Okay. You know, Rolls-Royce just laid off 9,000 people in the UK, right? We, I mean, it's coming to our shores anytime. <laughs> 
So, so I, I, yeah. So, so I feel, you know, I, I can see uh, the security of a job versus risk of an entrepreneur is, uh, are the two things that are being compared. Uh, yeah. Entrepreneurs are not risk takers. They're risk managers. A true entrepreneur would not sell their house, his house and his or her house and go put all the money into, onto an idea. They would yeah. take $100 and take, look at the problem to see is the problem real then maybe sure. take ten dollars to see if i created something would people buy then we ten thousand dollars to create the first prototype and at every single stage you are actually improving your chances of success and and that is how you manage risk so uh, i i i if 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 right at hundred dollars you realize that your company doesn't have a, a chance that is a perfect because you only spend hundred dollars and you have learned that, that you can't do things then you haven't wasted your money and so exactly so at entrepreneurial jobs are not secure at all you know who knows <laughs> what's the in next fact, we would argue to say that just to add on to what prof rajesh just said i think what we're actually encouraging is that this is an opportunity for you to actually as you mentioned this is an opportunity to look at problems in the market this is a time where you can turn it around become an entrepreneur Right, because there's just so much resources available for you to start off at this point. Maybe, maybe this period, while everything is being in a lockdown period, maybe it's a bit harder to start. You know, because interaction is a bit limited. But it just opens up a Pandora box of opportunities in terms of what you can solve, problems that you can solve. Go ahead, May. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point to bring up. Right, like I think a lot of people are forgetting the fact that yeah, actually. Um, you know, everyone is in a volatile situation at the moment. It's, yeah, not, it's yeah. not just startups. Like, big yeah. companies are also facing yeah. that. Um, I know my sister, she works in a, a, a very big consulting firm and they are also, you know, facing some, uh, you know, liquidity issues. Yes. Uh, they want to keep everyone, but, you yeah. know, at the, at the end of the day, you, you do need to cut your costs and to make sure that your business continues. Yeah. So, I think that's a really good point perspective to bring in um, and um, other questions you have quite a lot of yeah there's a lot of more, more yeah, questions I so I saw that um, okay maybe we can we can ask this one that has been submitted since the, the registration time so um, there is a question that uh, that was asked that um, do we see local industries change into digitalization anytime soon um, okay. They said that this could be done when the government and private sector work hand in hand. So I, I don't know what your, are your perspectives on this. So the quick answer, uh, <laughs> I, I, I know we, we, the, you know, I saw this cartoon which said, uh, "Who drove your corporate to digitization?" And say A, CEO, B, CTO, C, yeah. cor coronavirus. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and the answer actually. in both cases is in all cases is coronavirus because yeah. people. I haven't moved because they were so happy with status quo. Yeah. And uh, if today you feel haven't gone digital, uh, you, you know, this is suicidal. Okay. Yeah. So the, 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 because so another company can come and bring in, primarily digitization brings in such efficiency in operation growth and, mm -hmm. and all that. Uh, so it is absolutely important to have, but then you, without, without that, uh, it will be very, very dangerous to survive. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Zilera, you had... No, 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 absolutely. I, I, I fully agree with you. Uh, but I guess the, the other, the flip side to it is, uh, it's a restart button. I think COVID is a restart for many businesses and individuals. That's wonderful, yeah. Uh, you know, so we're, we, 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 it's... It, sometimes I say we need to figure things out ourselves. Like even from a magic perspective, I'm not going to claim we know everything. We're trying to scramble as well, trying to figure out what works, what doesn't work. And I also have questions from many industries, you know, asking us because they, well, rightly or wrongly, they look to the government for guidance, right? So they're asking us, what can we do in the tourism sector? What can we do in agri? What can we do in plantation, right? So I guess this is an opportunity that we're looking with the ministry as well to identify all technology solutions that we've been creating in the past. As I've mentioned, the universities, the research institutes, we've got tons of technologies sitting. This is probably the opportunity where we're actually going to jumpstart. We're going to dig out everything and bring it out to the market and say, you know what, we're going to find where we can apply this best. 
right? So if you're talking about uh, agri for that matter, um, right now we've got an issue with foreign labor, right? A lot of the infections came in through foreign labor, right? How do we reduce foreign labor? How do we increase our local talent getting into industries that are not too sexy, like plantation for that matter, or agri for that matter? A lot of these industries are populated by foreign labor. How do we get in our local labor? So one way to do it is add digitalization, add robotics, right? So get them all in, it becomes sexier and people want to be part of it, right? But again, let me caution, all of this takes time, right? It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen next week. But I guess to, to embrace ourselves for that change, which is actually imminent, it is coming. We will need to equip ourselves with the necessary knowledge. You need to go out and start you know, equipping yourself as to how do you work with a digital environment? How do you how do you equip your team to be more tech savvy for that matter? A lot of us, I think when we when we when we came into the lockdown period, a lot of us didn't even know how to operate virtual calls. <laughs> Fair point, yes. <laughs> right? Let alone sophisticated technology. You know, a lot of us were scrambling. How do we run our meetings online? You know, MS Teams, Microsoft Teams was a new concept. Right. Um, in fact, I think before this, many of us only had Skype on our app as far as virtual teleconferencing is con concerned. So, yeah. Yeah, great. Great points, actually. So, actually, we have come to like the, the time for the session to the webinar to end. However, there's a lot, uh, a lot of questions that are still coming in and we're happy to hang around and take them. Yeah. Um, for, the, thank, uh, for those of you who join us and you have prior commitments, like feel free to... Um, go to them. Um, for the others who are still interested to continue uh, with us in the conversation, um, I encourage you to also like hang back, hang around. Um, in fact, right now, maybe I can ask another question that it has come from the audience. So actually, there is a, uh, there is a question that goes, so we have uh, some, I guess, uh, viewers from the Agent Development Bank and they, they, they ask, at ADB, we've seen some gaps in the impact that are related to young people who uh, are, you know, disproportion disproportionately negatively affected by the economic impacts. In fact, 86% of the young people in Asia prior to the crisis were in informal work um, and they're high, highly vulnerable to the economic shock. And a lot of them are also engaged in uh, hard hit sectors, you know. So there are a lot of models that exist uh, for projected job loss due to COVID-19, but not disaggregated by gender or age. So there's also a gap that exists in the number of youth-led startups or young people employed by startups. Um, and I think maybe Zulera can also chime in on this a little bit. So apparently the team in uh, the Asian Development Bank is working with ILO to fill some of these gaps related to the impact so they're also looking for some partners in this journey. So I guess like, I don't know if uh, Prof Raj or Juan Zulera, you guys can chime in on this in terms of, if you know about, you know, these um, young people being more uh, disproportionately negatively affected by these economical impacts, and maybe like what are some of the things that uh, you guys are also engaged in, in terms of um, kind of mitigating this, this gap? So I feel we could use these young people as the catalyst for this change in being becoming creating entrepreneurship ecosystems. So imagine if you have unemployed, underemployed youth, uh, if you could train them and change their thinking, they send them back to their towns and villages to impact others to you know find problems, solve problems locally. Uh, we are actually starting a, a little ripples of, of of entrepreneurship changes in in uh, rural communities, and uh, entrepreneurship need to start at the at the at the at the mind stage. So that means you need to kind of change the, uh, somebody's thinking first, uh, so that they could actually go out and uh, take all the opportunities and resources that are available from the top. So, for that kind of change, could be made uh, using these. Uh, unemployed graduates and you know uh, underemployed you know, youth as the change makers in the community yeah and i don't know if once where you want to chime in on how magic has also 
um, maybe also help to mitigate this gap with like younger population in terms of like wanting to get into entrepreneurship and starting their own businesses, yeah. more formal employment. Yeah. So I, I'd like to tie that with a couple of questions that I noticed. You know, a lot of a lot of the questions were around how do we actually tackle industries that are very hardly hit. You know, I think I saw in um, aviation, uh, tourism, and I think a couple more in there. So I think from a magic's perspective, like I said, uh, we we always position ourselves or we take pride in the fact that we want to equip people with ideas, right? Mm -hmm. If you have the right idea or if you have the right product you think will address a particular problem, please come to us. You know, we actually want to open our doors right now to say that we want to sort of collect these ideas on behalf of the government and we try and help you through this, you know, take you and, and, and help you scale bigger, whether it's connecting you with the right kind of training, capacity building programs, and even funding. So we want to facilitate that from that perspective. It could be a startup, it could be an individual, right? So when we talk about these industries, I think if you take aviation for that matter, opening up aviation or making aviation safer is probably the most important thing at this point, right? Basically to actually generate economic activities. A lot of people are afraid. Uh, we can't basically travel between countries because mm -hmm. of the you know, travel restrictions put at this point. So in terms of technology and innovation, what could possibly be those technology that can provide comfort for travelers, right? We want to look at those kind of things, right? If, you, if you're talking about, you know, maybe heat sensors, um, COVID detection at airport, right? Or, or even say, for instance, I think I, I read an article where Ayata was, was proposing a, a immunity passport, but I don't know if that would work. I really don't know if that could work. But if, you know, if we could come up with innovative solutions to actually make travel safer, right? Yeah, they're training one. dogs for detecting COVID. Yeah, I mean, what? Yeah. yeah, it was in, in the UK, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right? And similarly, tourism, right? So these are big industries which are interrelated. If we cannot find solutions to actually make these industries safer, then we're actually heading towards a real doomsday in that sense, right? Um, a lot of the jobs are also affected. So I, I think on behalf of the government, I'd actually like to open up that you know, that, that sort of application. If you have innovative ideas, if you're thinking of great things that you want to propose to the government, please reach out, right? This is the time that we want to facilitate. So great. I'd like yeah. to, uh, I, I saw this question, what type of skill set do you think you would be useful for hot selling in the new job market in future? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I would say, but don't focus on the job market. Focus on what skills would the future jobs need. Uh, I think if we could fo focus on problem solving yeah. skills, you know, multidisciplinary skills, uh, critical thinking skills, creative skills, uh, because you don't know what the tomorrow's problems are. So you can't say this is exactly what the skill you need for tomorrow is. But the general skills that can solve any kind of problem is what is needed at any time. And self-learning skills, and that is a, the primary thing. You should be able to figure out and learn things on your own. Uh, what about you, Ponsilera? Oh, I, I fully agree. I fully agree. I think it's it's about preparing yourself for the future jobs more than anything else, right? And and again, I, if and it applies to all of us. Um, and, and again, we can't predict the future, but it's trying to evolve the way we think. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an evolution on every front from an industry's perspective, from an individual growth perspective, from the way we work, from the way we deliver our programs, from the way we operate business models, everything is changing. Mm. Um, again, going back to the point where large businesses, some find that, you know, there's just not much security with startups large businesses have to scale down, right? Uh, we just, just before getting on the call, we spoke about how big companies are actually reducing office space, literally office space. <laughs> yeah. So that's in anticipation yeah. of, a, of, a, of a downsizing, I would say, yeah. you know? So, so yeah. you know, uh, I think Tata Consultancy Service uh, said that 75% of the employees will be working from home forever. Yeah. So that means... Uh, you, you may not need such large offices. That's going to affect the real estate market. It's going to affect so many, you know, again, 
five house we can actually yep. think about what how each uh, next the uh, 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 customer would would respond and yep. there are opportunities at every single level as an entrepreneur i am very excited about this time it yep. sounds awful but you know but uh, <laughs> but <laughs> entrepreneurs are looking at not looking at they're not the, they're not like uh, half empty or half full guys they're looking at how do you want it to be do you want to fill up fill up the water or empty the i'll charge you for both you know so it is a opportunist and then you see opportunity opportunities all over the place okay so uh yeah. yes yeah i think i think today we talked a lot about like you know how covid has impacted our jobs market today and um how we think you know that might uh evolve and the opportunities that we're already seeing right now especially going into more digitalization like pivoting in terms of the business model um and also how like um entrepreneurship or, or startups or especially around um uh tech innovation startups can create actually a lot of new jobs in the market and i think the last point like actually that that we were just talking about was maybe like one of the the more important thing that i took away today personally like that you know we're always looking at um we always have this like pre preconception of like how the world works you know mnc's have more jobs um um startups are more volatile uh, etc um but i think the most important thing is to remember that you know the world is kind of uh, currently changing and it's constantly changing and uh i mean with covid being around i think it's a good point to kind of reflect and think about you know rather than what is what we see as the world today um what we can do personally to kind of also be adaptable to the changes that might come I think on this note like I would like to get uh, us uh Ponzulera and Prof Raj if you can maybe like just maybe summarize some of the few key takeaways you might want our audiences today to to bring home with them um as kind of like our final note for today So I I I'll, I know we had a bunch of questions that the people who registered had uh, posted yesterday and uh, I, uh, kind of wrote some answers to that because i know we couldn't get to all the questions so i will post it in the chat so hopefully if, uh, if, uh, you know you could copy it and read it or whatever so or it, it's not printing okay anyway uh, uh primary takeaway is that uh, uh we need to create jobs otherwise things are going to get harder and harder and it's going to get a little messier uh, jobs are the point of change and uh, corporations are not going to create jobs unless the unless the economy is stable the demand is real uh, so they're not going to go hire millions of people uh, governments may create the infrastructure jobs and some jobs that are at the bottom end but imagine all these jobs cost 20 to 50000 per head to create a job okay if you want to create 300 jobs by bringing building building a factory costing 30 million job 30 million dollars each per head cost is very high entrepreneurship is the cheapest way to create jobs because the startup costs are much less uh, and they already as i showed they create the the largest amount of jobs in 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 any community so uh governments and the government programs need to start talking about entrepreneurship as a uh, in their policy discussions to see how do we bring in entrepreneurship as a means to create jobs absolutely necessary uh, it is not a good to have thing anymore that is absolutely the key way to get out of this crisis uh so hopefully uh you know asb has been doing a lot of work in this space in in communities and universities and such would lo- really love to help with this thing and uh with that i'd love to uh as ponzilera to make her remarks thank you prof rajesh so i guess um uh, just to build on from what prof rajesh has actually just mentioned from the government's perspective um take it from me in, in the sense that we are doing everything in our capacity right now in fact more than ever to emphasize 
assistance to entrepreneurship, right? And and we know that at this point in time, employment, business opportunities, economic resilience is really the top key focus of the government. And, if, and you can see that in all the all the budget announcement that has been made over the last two months. I, I think this is probably the largest budget announcement that has been made in a period of two and a half months, which is very, very needed for the economy. It's a stimulus package at the end of the day. However, I think from a, from a market perspective, my key takeaway is this. Innovative solutions, um, what's needed for the industry or what's needed from the country cannot come from the government. It has to come from the private sector. It has to come from the grassroots in that sense. So think about how to take this period as an opportunity to turn around your ideas, right? If you're thinking about something innovative that you think can be life-changing, it possibly can, right? Mm -hmm. Reach out, find ways to, to, to empower yourself and your organizations to take that, 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 that ideas forward. And you have various agencies, you have various government organizations that can help you through that period, uh, through that to facilitate, all right? That's one. But I guess the other key takeaway is um, you need to always... Think of ideas, think of products from a user's perspective. In this period, in this period, right, if you're talking about COVID, you're talking about addressing a pandemic situation. It's really about creating comfort level for the users, right? You want to be able to sell your idea or sell your products to people that can use it. And when you're using it, it needs to generate comfort, right? From a safety perspective, from a health perspective, from a travel perspective. Um, so I go back to the two key industries that I mentioned earlier, aviation and tourism. The, the, it's possibly the two key industries that's going to move a lot of movement, right? Traffic into the country. Those are the two key industries. And we need traffic into the, in the, into the country right now, which is very much restricted because people are afraid, right? Uh, how do we address these things? So if you're thinking about anything around that, please, please reach out. Um, and I think um, look at this period as an opportunity. I think Prof Rajesh mentioned many, many examples around how this should actually change our mindset. Um, and it's really about the mindset more than anything else. Uh, sometimes maybe you can turn around. I, I, I have people who actually turn around and ask us, you know what, you're in very comfortable, cushy positions, you know, you don't have to worry about job security. Again, it's a myth. Job security is a myth. Everyone has got is in a position right now where tomorrow you may not have a job. You know, it's, it's a world these days. So what part of the current uh, stimulus package has been focused on entrepreneurship building? Yeah. So if you, if you see the last announcement, I think there was a huge chunk that was actually announced through loans for small businesses. And recently, there was another loan that was actually announced for tech startups. That's actually a very low interest loan that was actually provided through Malaysian debt ventures. So there's a lot of lifeline that's been provided for tech startups as well as SMEs. But can you, know, can you think... also train them? That's a, that's a question. Can you train more yeah. on universities? So... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that's done through the agencies like ourselves. So a lot of us actually do that capacity building and training through our existing budgets, okay. right? So we're actually reprioritizing a lot of our programs to actually focus on building resilience, right? How do we actually help more businesses that are more targeted to building COVID-type solutions? So we recently yeah. launched a deep tech bootcamp because what we see is that you need a lot more deep tech solutions. You need artificial intelligence. You need blockchain. You need, you need fancy technology to address COVID. Yeah, I think, and I think like, I think, Wanzula, you, you kind of answered a lot of the questions actually in the Q&A, like through your takeaways. And I think, I think that's really important because um, I guess, at least in Malaysia, there is a robust uh, support system actually available. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, um, and yeah, and I think in, in Malaysia, like, Wanzula, you're absolutely right. Like, um, there are already a support system. If you actually want to do it, um, you have to ask yourself, like, um, and go and take action um, and shift your mindset into into wanting to do it. And I think like with with Prof Raj, like you said that yeah, you know that there, there needs to be these programs, you know, that are available. And I think there are still a lot of countries out there that are still or in the region that are still figuring this out. And I think um, like chiming in on these um, webinar itself, 
it is uh, an opportune moment for uh, governments, companies to actually look at um, how these ecosystem can be built up to be more <clears throat> robust so that we can encourage more of these movements into entrepreneurship. So I think on, on that note, like thank you to everyone who's come to join us today. Thank you, Prof Raj. Thank you, Fonzulera. Thank you so much thank for you. your time, taking time thank out. Thank you so much, Bri. Um, and, for, and for all of the participants, like we have other um, programs available through our AFB Executive Education. If you're more interested, uh, interested in more of these kind of programs, like do go on our website, or you can also scan this QR code to leave us some suggestions about what you might like to hear from us. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at the next engagement. Yeah. And, and ASB is really focusing on digital transformation related programs. Uh, please contact uh, ASB and look, take a look at the website. On that. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, much. Thank you Ponzalera. Thank you, thank May. Thank you, Prof Rajesh. Thank <laughs> you, May. Bye. Thank you, Sun, our shadow moderator. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you all so much. Yeah. Bye-bye.